Good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon. Hello, hello. Um, so happy to be here with you all. Uh, my name is Kevin Kilroy, and um, this is Laird Hunt, author of many fantastic books, but uh, specifically, um, we're going to be talking mostly about his most recent book, Never Home. Um, out, it's just been about a year, right? That's right, yeah. So just a quick introduction to give you all a sense of, of, of Laird, and um, then we're going to... Uh, uh, read a little bit from the book and then, and then talk the rest of the time and some question and answers at the end. Um, so in terms of the theme being citizen, there's really no uh, better writer that I know of that really exemplifies what it means to be um, a citizen of literature, a citizen of, uh, of the writing world. Um, Laird was my teacher at Naropa University 10 years ago. And um, I'll never forget um, a couple weeks into class, he just kind of stopped at you know, the beginning of class and just asked everybody, like, are there any reading series going on? Is anybody getting a um, uh, reading series up and going? And we all kind of looked at each other. We were like, no. Um, and then he's like, OK, well, it's, you know, it's kind of a, a neat part of being a writer. We, we, we got the idea and started up a reading series um, a little bit after that. And of course, Laird shows up to the reading series, brings his flask, something to read, and to be a part of it. No flask on me today. <laughs> <laughs> um, but really, that idea of, um, to be a writer means so much more than to put words on page and to contribute to the community either through reading series, through um, publication, you know, starting up a press, working in that regard, an editor, um, doing reviews, all these sort of ways that you can contribute and you can make the, the, uh, the writers, uh, um, make the community, enrich the community and, and keep on pushing the good work forward. So um, Laird influenced a lot of us in that way, which is, uh, is so fantastic. And, and when you look at his books and you think about um, that same idea of how you, you're working with the community in terms, of, in terms of writing. His books are always aware and working in the traditions of literature and um, uh, pushing things forward in really fantastic ways. Um, I just think in terms of uh, um, writing books that mean more than just sort of what you're working on in I isolation, but an acknowledgement of, of the, the grander uh, scheme of literature and traditions in, in, terms, of, in terms of writing. Um, another great thing that Laird does is he champions um, contemporary writers. He is actively reading and, um, and, and giving good word and good praise to, to the writing that needs to get out there. Um, if you want to, to have an education, just get a book list from Laird and, and it, will, uh, it will stimulate uh, um, your reading and your writing. Um, his novels, you know, they're they're the real thing. I mean, as much as uh, um, that's sort of hyper hyperbolic, they're just really they're just really fantastic. They're they're a blend of multitudes, um, lyrical and hard boiled, uh, cantankerous at times and suave, humorous as well as haunting, um, realism that lets the floor drop out, and surrealism that possibilizes the world of literature, as much as the world um, we we look to when we close the book. Um, at times, urban, avant-garde, slick and cool, and other times, gnarly hollers of America's mournful and witty Midwest. Um, it's a really uh, uh, great work um, that really combines a lot of, a lot of stuff together. His seventh novel is, is Never Home, no, not counting translations, and some collaborative works and, and mysterious chapbooks from earlier on in, in his career. Um, Never Home is a story of, it's a story of loss and it's a story of, of reckoning. Um, Character Constance Thompson leaves her home and husband behind to fight in the Civil War. Um, historical fiction, epic poem, American Americana murder ballad, uh, surrealist psychological warfare, elegant confession, folklore. You know, you sausage all these sort of uh, things together, and you realize that this book is it's a it's a, a whole new sort of uh, a feast to uh, to enjoy. And um, at first glance, it's a hero's tale a call to, uh, to citizenry, a noble risk for the Union's cause, but you know, uh, there's so many more uh, mysteries than that um, when, you, uh, when you read it. So I really encourage everybody to check it out. and excited to hear from it and talk to you about it. Thanks. Thanks, Kevin. Thanks, everyone, for coming out. Thank you to the Chicago Humanities Festival. It's amazing to be part of this. Um, and I will say uh, that um, Kevin has a, a first novel coming out uh, shortly called The Escapees. So, he didn't say it himself, I'll say it to you. Something to look for 
uh, from uh, Spite and Dival Press, terrific press out of New York. Um, so I'm, I'm going to read from, from deep in the, in the heart of this book, which is um, not something I, I typically do. Uh, I so often fear that uh, the novelist dilemma, how do you set up this scene deep in, in the novel? But I think that this is kind of a, and this was a, really at Kevin's suggestion, this is kind of a standalone um, that'll give you a sense of the territory. I'm not going to read for very long. We'll get into the conversation. Um, but I will say it is the, the, the narrator, our, our hero, anti-hero, um, if you will, Constance Ash Thompson, who has left war and is heading home, and she encounters someone else along the road, someone who has done the same thing as, as she did, which is to disguise herself as a man and, and fight uh, in a civil war. And we'll get into the, um, the fact that there were hundreds of women who did this during, during the war in actual life, but for now we'll just enter into the novel, and I'll give you a little taste of this. Um, it's, it's a tough scene, but it, it gives a sense of, of the territory. So she's just left some trials and tribulations behind and is on the road. That afternoon, I slept my way until dusk time in a cave and a hickory tree had been hollowed out to smoke meat. There were some meat shreds caught in the wrinkles and crevices of the wood, and my fingers found them and felt of them and brought them to my mouth. I woke at moonrise with my teeth chattering hard enough to crack hickory nuts and set off at a trot up the road to try and get warm. It was in any ways at all up the road when I came upon another traveler, a colored gal I knew straight off I had seen before, though it took me a minute to know where. She was taller than me and broader at the shoulder. She walked like she wasn't back in a dress. Maybe she had always walked that way, down in a field, 100-pound basket on her back. It came to me. The last time I had seen her, she had been marching out of our camp wearing contraband pantaloons. You can come on out of the shrubbery, I said, for she had vanished as quick as spit as soon as I had came up on her. I called this out more than once. I called it out and told her I wasn't going to alert the guard or the dogs or anything. I said I knew she was hiding in the bushes, not even an apple throw away, and that she ought to quit being scared and come out. Or if she couldn't quit being scared, she ought to come out anyway. I was heading north, I said, and if she liked, we could be two travelers together on the road instead of two travelers apart. I said all of this and felt like I was making quite a fair speech out there in the dark night, but it wasn't until I told her I knew she had been a man and that I had been one too that she came up out of the bushes. She was even bigger standing next to me than she had looked hurrying along the chalky road. We hung there some time not saying any word, then settled kind of gradual into walking. She was dressed in heavy skirts and a shawl, she had a rag bundle in one hand and a heavy stick in the other. Have you had anything to eat, I said. She shook her head, so I fetched her up a cracker. It took some time of me holding it out and of us walking along for her to take it. It took even more of us walking down the road and past a frozen pond and through a grove of burnt trees, holding up their empty devil hands at the dark for her to lift it up to her mouth and crunch. What regiment, she said. I told her, and when she said she'd shouldered her rifle a while for the 5th U.S. colored, I asked her why she had stopped. Why did you stop, she said. I gave out a cough, started out as a laugh at how long it would take me to answer, and we left it there at that. After a minute and another bite of wilty cracker, she said, after Antietam, that's where I saw you. And I said that was right, and something a little like a smile came up in her eyes, but it didn't stay there long. I thought you were a ghost coming along that road back there, she said. I'm not a ghost, I said. I don't think I'm a ghost. Ghost of my old mistress come along the road to catch me. Left her dead of a finger went sour back in South Carolina. She came to me all through the fighting, pointing at me with that finger. I showed her my fingers. She nodded. She also shivered a little, and you could see plain it wasn't a shiver come from the cold. I've seen a ghost, I said. I think I did. She nodded, kind of sucked up her lips. My ghost had a knife. Ghosts don't need knives. Mine did. She looked away to the side, shook her head. You got to get north and out of this country, I said. We could help each other, share the road. Share the road, she said. If she had been a well, you could have dropped a stone down her throat and not heard any echo. We kept walking, with her some way in front or some way behind, and after some good yards of this, I started to talk. I had it in my mind, I suppose, to cheer us a little along the way after our talk about ghosts, maybe pull a story or two out of her, hear something about her fighting days, march along together like two soldier men, even if we were wearing dresses. But the stories I told her were about, as twist, were about as twisted up as wet turkey feathers, and she just kept breathing in and breathing out and looking back and forth across the road. 
I told one about Antietam because we had both of us been in those parts deep in those ugly times about an unscratched lieutenant, had done well for his men in the fight, and when it was over, leaned his head against a hot cannon barrel and burned off his ear. That story had seemed funny to me at one time, but it didn't any longer out there on the road in the moonlight. So I told her another meant to be rosier about a Confederate boy so hungry he tried to play bear and got himself stung to death by scooping up fresh honey. When we come up on him, I told it. He had gotten so swollen you could have rolled him down a hill like a ball. There was an old lady had a corncob pipe stuffed in her mouth sitting there next to him said she had some claim on this bee stung boy, though what claim that could have been I do not know because we didn't ask. We left her sitting there with her legs splayed out waiting for him to swell back down. He had something of hers in his pockets, she told us, as we walked away, and the swelling had stretched them too tight, and she couldn't fetch her hand in. I gave a chuckle when I told this story, but my fellow wanderer didn't think as much of it as I did. The hell kind of story is that to tell, she said. You ever pretended you, like you needed a shave, I asked? A shave? Thinking about shaves set me to thinking about Mar Bartholomew, my husband, and I told my companion about the beard that would never grow very well on his face. Though maybe I said, during the many months that had galloped past since I left home, he had learned the beard-growing trick. I told her about Bartholomew's small hands and how he was a better operator in the kitchen with his small hands than I was with mine. I told her he had a bottle of French cologne water that he liked to sprinkle on a handkerchief before he went out of a morning to do his work. I had missed him terribly, I told her, and more all the time. I was going home to him now to reacquaint myself with him after the hard separation and set things straight on our farm and settle scores. I'll stop with that. You know, it, that's a, it's just a great um, section to hear some of, the, some of the phrasing, some of the, um, the words that she uses, the way she describes things, twisted up wet like turkey feathers, and um, heart was a biting thing, um, hard with like a hickory nut, or oh, uh, chattering so hard. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, the voice is, is the thing that, that just captures you and hypnotizes you with, with this book right off the bat. And it's such a separate voice from your voice, which I know so well, mm -hmm. um, and your, your voice, which is, is more present for me in your earlier books. Mm -hmm. um, talk to us about this voice. Where did this voice come from? How did you follow this, and, and uh, what was the process with that? Sure, yeah. This book took about, um, I guess, about 15 years to, for me to be able to write. And it started with a, a gift that my wife um, Alanis Kellyanis gave me um, one of those sort of miraculous gifts and you don't know their worth really until some years have passed. And it was a, a, a very slim volume called An Uncommon Soldier. And it was the Civil War letters of a certain Sarah Wakeman who went to war and fought under the name Lyons Wakeman. And it was the letters home from this young person, she was in her early 20s, uh, to her family in upstate New York. And they were letters about being in battle, about serving guard duty, uh, about waiting, about being homesick, all of these things um, that young soldiers write home with the added nuance that this was a young woman writing these. And sometimes she signed her letters Sarah, and sometimes she signed them Lions, which is interesting in terms of the, the question of uh, censorship. Nobody was reading these letters. And her mm -hmm. family received them in wartime, which was also interesting to me. In the introduction to this, this book, by scholar Lauren Cook, uh, it, uh, I, I learned to my astonishment that there were, at that time, this was now about 20 years ago um, from now, uh, there were at least 400 women they had documented who served for both the North and the South during the American Civil War. And this, you know, I found this extraordinary, um, amazing, something to, to think about, but I couldn't do anything with it because I didn't have the voice for this character. I wasn't ready to write this particular novel. Uh, and it wasn't until about five years ago that uh, when we were coming up on the 150th anniversary of the, of the Civil War, which was from 1861 to 1865, uh, that uh, I read a, an article in passing, uh, an article that mentioned in passing uh, at the very end by the, by the uh, very interesting scholar, Tony Horowitz, that so much remained to be uh, discovered about the Civil War or remained myth-encrusted. And I thought again of these women. And it was within a couple of weeks that this voice came to me. The first line of the book, I was strong and he was not. So it was me went to war to defend the Republic. And the whole book poured out of that voice. It took years to have it and the, there was the voice and the story came out of that and what she had to say and what she did and, and why she was telling it. Yeah, I mean, 
it feels like it's got that sort of urgency and, and, and energy through it. It's, it's, really, it's really superb. What about in terms of, once you, once you got it, in terms of honing it, like, did, did it, was it fun doing the research into sort of language that either A is from, you know, the, the, the mid-1800s, or I felt like sometimes there was like aspects of it that, I don't, I don't know what people talked like at that time, mm -hmm. except for maybe through other stories mm -hmm. and movies, or like sort of like playing with that and kind of a, a coming up with your own sort of version of, of what, how she would describe the world and what phrasing and syntax would be there. Was that a fun part of the research? It was fun, and part of it was getting to channel my, my alas, now departed uh, grandmother, who did uh, a lot of my, uh, um, took care of me for quite a number of years on a farm in rural Indiana. And she, when she was a little girl on this farm, there were still Civil War veterans uh, in, in the community. And uh, her voice, um, she was a school teacher and had traveled the world. She, she taught Latin and, and English and literature. Um, but she was also this kid from a farm in rural Indiana who was, in fact, uh, stillborn on this farm. Um, and part of her uh, uh, determined nature was the fact that there, there happened to be a second doctor there that day in that farmhouse uh, who took this child who was not breathing and pumped cold water on her, and she started uh, squalling. Mm -hmm. And uh, so she was this fierce, determined uh, individual, stood about five foot tall, uh, but was kind of like a hurricane. And when she was uh, dismayed by my behavior, uh, this other voice would come out, and she would start to drop uh, certain words in her sentences. Her phrasings would change, and she would raise her tone. And it was uh, that voice that I drew on. So not the voice of my grandmother, but the voices she was haunted by, these older voices um, that came with a sense of, of urgency. So there was that. That was that piece of the puzzle in, in writing this novel and, and finding, you know, extending it and revising it. Then there was all the research. These women were, were, who actually did this were extraordinary. I recommend a book to you called uh, They Fought Like Demons by Lauren Cook and Deanne Blanton. The, the, I think they're the two major scholars on this. Uh, and there are stories uh, in there that you, you just almost can't believe. Uh, for example, the, the woman who fought out of Tennessee, young woman named Melverina Elverina Peppercorn. <laughs> right? <laughs> right? That you can almost stop and we can all just walk out and go have <laughs> coffee. Um, but it gets even better because Melvarine Elverina went to war uh, with her twin brother, whose name was Alexander the Great Peppercorn. <laughs> fortunately, fortunately uh, he went by Lexi, which made things, I would imagine, a lot easier uh, for everyone involved. But they went, to, they went to war together. I don't know who took this decision, but of course Melvarine Elverina had to, to uh, uh, disguise herself. They went to war, fought one battle, and Lexi was, was wounded. And Melverina Elverina took off her uh, uniform, put her dress back on, took him to the hospital, and nursed him back to health. And then they banish both of them from the history books. Um, but you would encounter these things, or, or Fanny Wilson, who fought uh, for the North, um, who fought for two years in a, an infantry regiment, was discovered, kicked out, which is immediately what happened when you were upon discovery. Two years, though, think about this. Uh, and she decided she was going to go um, do some work in Cairo, Illinois, not too far, terribly far from here, this state. Um, and which was, it was a big military encampment. She danced as a ballerina for about six months. <laughs> so she went from the infantry to the ballerina, and then she decided, uh, I'm not a dancer. And she <laughs> went and joined the cavalry regiment and fought, and then was discovered and kicked out uh, as, as a spy. Um, but just you know, so, you know, th these cases were amazing to read about, and sometimes it's just tantalizing little pieces of evidence that they left behind. Sometimes they left behind um, documents, though, and you get a taste of their voice. Loretta Velasquez was a soldier from the South who left, wrote a, wrote a memoir um, that was discredited after the war, and that's part of the, the fascinating thing was this history was kind of covered up. This did not fit uh, with the narrative of the in, the, in terms of the South, Jubal Early, the general who helped uh, create this idea of the lost cause, this noble struggle. Um, uh, he was very active in discrediting Loretta Velasquez, because there were some inaccuracies in her book. She made things sound a little bit better than they were, but the truth of the matter is she went and fought um, as an officer with a commissioned exoskeleton of whalebone to hide her curves um, and fake mustaches. So she had means. Wow. Uh, and she left this, this document behind. Um, Sarah Emma Edmondson fought, was, was a soldier who fought for the North, and she came from very poor circumstances in, in Canada in a very abusive family situation. And she went to war to escape that, and she went as a common soldier. And so she wrapped a blanket around her waist. Uh, and the ill-fitting uniforms of the time hid her, but she left a memoir. And so drawing on those resources, I was able to, um, to, to construct this, this, this story, this voice. Um, and then also just looking at the um, journals and let collections of letters home of common male soldiers, the, yet those sometimes boys at 17 or 18 who wrote these letters home, wanting to know what people were eating for supper. 
those kinds of things, eternal concerns. And so out of all of that, I was able to, to build this, this voice and, and, and carry it through for, for a couple hundred pages. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, I think about, as a fiction writer, I think you've really contributed to, to history in terms of getting us to, uh, to look back at this time and, and see it in a different way. And somehow, fiction can also offer us a little bit more accuracy in some sort of way mm-hmm. to really get to know the human underneath there, right? Um, the first time I discovered Herodotus, the great father of history, Greek, um, was in a fiction class you know, with you. What is it like for you to be a fiction writer and to be participating in history in this way? You know, I know that you, you love um, studying and researching history. Does mm-hmm. it feel strange? Does it feel, feel, feel right? Well, you know, I, I love it that you mentioned Herodotus and thinking about these narrators and this narrator in this book. Uh, because he, Herodotus was known as the father of history, but then he was also sometimes called the father of lies. Uh, and thinking of, you know, and if you look at the histories by Herodotus, um, amazing, amazing document, so much of it is so clearly made up. Um, he's talking about things, he's reporting conversation that happened a thousand miles away 200 years before, but he's reporting it as if he was, he was a witness to it. And <laughs> thinking about that notion of reliability, unreliability, and what happens when you tell a story, and in this case, um, someone who's telling about this on the one, you know, on one level, it's this interesting thing she did during the war. And a lot of soldiers wrote their memoirs. They got into their, their autumn years, and I'm going to write about what happened to me in the war. And she had a particularly interesting thing to write about this, the fact that she went and, and uh, set herself all kinds of problems by going in disguise to war. Um, but to me, that wasn't, it was very clear very early on that that wasn't why she was telling this story. That wasn't enough for this. Um, to, yeah, I did this unusual thing, and I'm going to tell you about how I faced the challenges. She's telling it because she wants to confess something, something that happens when she gets home from the fight, uh, something that's very difficult, very dark, and she doesn't know how to say it, and so she's telling her story to get herself to the point of being able to finally say, this is what I did. This is this thing that I haven't been able to say. Um, and so when you're telling that kind of story, uh, do you uh, go down the line and, and, and tell truth every uh, moment along the way, none of us do that, right? And, and we, we fumble for things, and we tell a little bit wrong, and we say, wait a minute, that isn't quite how it happened. And if you're trying to um, work up the courage to say that really difficult thing, then maybe the imagination comes to play uh, uh, into it uh, even more frequently. Um, and so she is, uh, she, this, this narrator has some of both history, uh, but also some lying that happens. And it's lying because she, does, she isn't quite strong enough yet to tell this, this thing that she has to tell. Um, so I, I find all those questions really interesting. Uh, and always try to remember with these, these narrators, first person narrators, that they're, they're humans. They're not machines. They're not vehicles for, for me to uh, uh, put this story down on the paper. They get to be humans all the way along the line, mm-hmm. um, for better or worse. Right? Mm-hmm. Um, one thing I'd, I've never asked you about this before, I'm, I'm really Curious, in, in all of your works, I see this, um, this, this really this always working with this, this theme of death. Mm-hmm. Um, quite often we are wondering with, with characters in, in Laird's book whether they're alive or dead. We're just sort of like prompted with this sort of nuance like, okay, wait a minute, are we, is this the afterlife? Is it? And then it kind of comes back. It's almost like, if, if, if it's a, a veil, a sort of a wavering veil, it's like sometimes you're in the territory of death, sometimes you're in the territory of life. Mm. Why do you see fiction as a, as a good way to sort of like confront mm. some, some a topic such as death, and, and how does that work for you? Well, I, I love that idea of something that, that, that's moving like this. I'm, I'm really interested in border zones. Um, I think that it, it's a border zones, even something like a doorway, you know, th- things that happen from, from one room to the next fascinate me. Um, and, and continue to do so on your right from the very beginning. I've, I've been in, intrigued by this territory. Uh, maybe in part returning this, this uh, I evoked my, my paternal grandmother, um, who was so important to me before, uh, living um, as, a, as a teenager in a house with someone who was in her last years, really. And so this, this sense of, of mortality, and she was, she was someone, um, you know, salty uh, old uh, Indiana woman who uh, talked about the fact that she was gonna be under the ground pretty soon mm-hmm. all the time. Um, and so from very early on, having that in my mind, that it was something, and I knew she knew she would, we would go to the cemetery and she said, I'm going to be right here, which is right next to my daddy and my, you know, my mother, et cetera, that kind of thing. And, and so the grave was, was pretty close um, from early on. And it's always seemed to me that uh, uh, without thinking about it beforehand, right, so I don't, when I start a project, I don't say, 
I talk about death and mm -hmm. how life and death are intermingled, and that, that that never happens. There's this voice that starts to talk, but it keeps it keeps coming back to this, and and certainly this character who's been through something as harrowing as war, um, or the the narrator of the previous novel, a kind one, which is also a first person female uh, narrator who is uh, uh, telling her story that is set in the context of, of antebellum slavery in Kentucky, um, border state, uh, obviously, um, just below Indiana. Um, and so people in these very, uh, very difficult, very charged situations, uh, it seems to me that death is gonna be in the mix, uh, at the very least, uh, to, to a small degree and sometimes to a greater degree. Hmm. I mean, it's, it's one of my favorite things to have fiction that confronts some mysterious stuff, some stuff that, you know, just sort of like straight ahead thinking doesn't quite work, or storytelling confront these things, right? What's the answer to this? Like, well, here, let me tell you a story, this sort of, this sort of thing. So mm -hmm. I'm always appreciating it uh, when I get to these moments uh, in your book. Um, you mentioned The Kind One, and then thinking in terms of uh, uh, Kind One and Never Home, and there's this project that you're working on called Dark American Quartet. Mm -hmm. Can you talk to us about this sort of larger um, project? Sure. Yeah, so it, it's, um, it's informally, I'm, I'm thinking of this, this group of books informally as, as, a, as a quartet and thinking about these, these very, these crucible moments in American history. Uh, and so the, the first one, Kind One, deals, uh, is set just in the years leading up to the Civil War and then Never Home, which takes place during the Civil War, the principal events. Uh, the next book is set in and around um, an, an infamous lynching in Marion, Indiana, which, uh, uh, is, is about an hour from the family farm. Um, and, uh, and then the, uh, the fourth book, as I'm conceiving it, uh, is, is throws, way, you know, throws back much earlier to um, colonial, colonial America, and it deals with witches. Um, and in all of these, I'm interested not in telling the received idea of, of these events, the rec you know, received notions of, of you know, what a narrative around that deals with slavery should be or, or of the Civil War. I didn't want to tell um, a, yet another tale of the Civil War that mentions all the generals and the, the kinds of um, guns that everyone was using and exactly their uniform mm -hmm. and the kind of hat they put on their head and um, trying to avoid that hobnailed boot uh, dilemma that uh, the, the writer David Lodge talks about in his, he has a wonderful short essay on historical fiction. Um, and it's that, so you're, you're, you're writing, you're, you're in your character's mind or very leaning right over the character's shoulder and d does, the character, he or she, say, and then I pulled on my hobnailed boots. Um, no, they're just pulling on their boot, right, or their shoe. Um, I put my shoes on and walked out the door, but the historical novelist's temptation, right, to, to say, well, you know, here's what they were wearing at that moment, um, and this is the kind of gloves that they slipped on, a particular kind of leather, and, and uh, how to um, avoid uh, going into those sort of, again, those received notions of, of what history is and what it means to interact with the past. Uh, and subvert it. And a lot of that has, has been this question of the narrators who in this project are all women. Um, and of course, I'm, you know, I'm, courting, I'm courting trouble with that. Uh, but I, but you know, my, I, I have never tried to hide the fact. Um, I, I, was, I was doing an interview recently about Never Home with a French journalist who's very hardcore. She's a war correspondent and then writes some literary stuff on the side. And the first thing she said to me was, well, I see you have hair on your chest. <laughs> uh, okay, we're gonna start, start with that. Um, but there's something about this being a, a stranger in a strange land, um, not hiding what I'm doing, stepping into you know, these other perspectives that has, that has um, made it possible for me to, to take these, narr uh, these narratives on and to tell these stories perhaps a little differently than they would have been told. Not better, I make no judgment about that at all, but just maybe a little bit differently. And it's been, for a novelist, I think a, a, a very, um, interesting challenge to set myself, and a daunting one, I must say. <laughs> yeah, I can't wait for the, the next one to come out. Um, I'm excited for it. You, you know, you mentioned um, being interested in thresholds, and um, it's sort of like what's going on in the next room. And I definitely feel in terms of uh, with Kind One and with Never Home, but you know, it's also in the other books too, but maybe even with just sort of like happening at a, at a more heightened level, you're really building a world of these, these thresholds that are occurring where sort of like, Coming back again to, to wells, we we heard the well mentioned in the in the part that we um, that we we just described the other soldier, right? The the black woman as like it had dropped a stone down her 
her throat, and it would have been like, a, a, like an empty or an endless well, I guess, right? Um, there's wells, there's sort of these, um, these sheds, there's these sort of the moments where it seems like these thresholds are, are really being built into it. How much are you sort of like crafting that into it and really making the, building those worlds in the, that way? Mm -hmm. Well, in the, in the case of the, these novels, Kind One and Neverhome, and, and indeed the, the next one, which is called Down Dark, <laughs> you think about wells, Down Dark, but, um, there it is once again. But I am, I'm finding ways to, with, without, the characters don't carry over from one novel to the next, but there are, there are themes, there are, there are uh, motifs, um, images that do carry over. And so you will encounter almost the same well in Neverhome that you do in, in Kind One, mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and so on with the others. I don't want to make it too heavy-handed. I'm really, I'm, I hope I'm, I'm not doing it that way. Uh, but there are things, hopefully, that will set up an echo in, in, in a reader's mind. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'm really interested in, in uh, narratives that do that, that find different ways to um, create a larger structure and create a sense of connection from one book to the next, not simply the character now, 10 years later, is going to continue his or her adventures. Um, I love that kind of book, but that's not the kind of thing that I'm interested in. It seems like if you're going to take on American history, you've got to have lots of different voices and perspectives and, and angles, uh, and it can't be too neat. Um, Faulkner said you got to complicate it up, right? And uh, I've, I've always had that in my mind, that notion of, of um, not simply to, you know, not or, or never to simply trip, trip a reader up or um, false co complications. But um, you're, you know, you look at something as as uh, uh, as uh, complicated, uh, inherently complicated, uh, and difficult and dark as American history. You know, you can't write a neat, straight story. It seems to me. Uh, and, and have something that feels at the end of it like it's, it's a, an honest appraisal, honest engagement. Um, so I've, I've always been wary about putting little bow ties at the end, um, which might f feel good for me, you know, right? I've stuck, I'm the gymnast who's done this amazing thing and then stuck my landing. Yeah. Uh, but what, what does the reader say? You know, sort of clap like this, oh, nice. Um, so the kind of books that I, I love are those ones that are sprawling, that are difficult, that are challenging books that deal with history like uh, the Known World by Edward P. Jones, um, a novel like Beloved by Toni Morrison. Those are, those are the books I look to when I'm thinking about you know, how, can, how can we take these, these challenging, difficult things on and do something that's commensurate or at least tries to be com commensurate with the size, the scope. Um, and so the, those are the, the kinds of heroes I look to. Mm. I'm thinking about also just sort of Indiana itself as a thing that we continue are returning to being your home state. Um, has Indiana welcomed you as, as, you know, our prodigal son, come back to us, Laird, you know, come do readings and, and uh, anything like that. Being so close to Indiana, maybe you've, some of you are from Indiana. Well, short answer, no. No. <laughs> I, I'm a graduate, but rather proud of Indiana University, and, and I, <laughs> I, haven't, I haven't received a phone call from them uh, <laughs> yet. Um, but uh, I, I don't hold it against uh, uh, Indiana. You know, I was, uh, but there are little signs that, that there's, there's an interest. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's when you write things that are, um, I was at the, the, the great talk yesterday by ta Coates, and he was talking about frankness and being frank. Um, and when, when you write, you know, my very different mode, uh, things that are frank about a, a particular place that, that don't necessarily shine the apple too much, let's say, um, then, you know, you're, you're, you might get a little reluctant, a reluctant hug from your, <laughs> from your near and, and dear. Uh, but uh, I, was in, I was in Marion this summer doing some last, uh, last session research on the ground uh, for, for the, the novel, Down Dark, and I, I went into the library and my books were there on the shelf, and I thought, okay, well, this is something. Mm -hmm. They may take them off when, <laughs> when this book comes out, uh, but no, I don't think that's true. I, you know, I'm, not, I'm not willfully going after, um, uh, they're, they're not that, that kind of book. Um, but it's, you know, Indiana is, uh, and especially my Indiana is, is a farm, really. It's my grandmother's house. That's kind of Indiana for me. Um, and that's the place where I return to, as my sister likes to say, when I go back to the farm, I get archival. I get this dreamy look. I'm, my research is going back and smelling the air mm -hmm. and picking up a handful of dirt and seeing if I, rem I remember how much it weighs after a rain, that kind of thing, um, or, or when it's dry, uh, and seeing what kind of insects are flying through what kind of uh, bush or plant or, or tree, uh, and you know when are the crab ap apples falling and how loud is the thunk on the ground? That you know that's the kind of research I'm I'm I'm, s I'm often doing. When I say I'm going on a research trip to Indiana, my wife just raises her eyebrow. <laughs> Here we go <laughs> research. Again. Yeah. 
I mean, just hearing you talk about that, that sort of research, that connection with the earth and um, this sort of authenticity there, it, it's, it gets me to keep on thinking of these works as more connecting with like the traditions of Americana mm -hmm. than possibly like the genre of historical fiction, mm -hmm. right? And hearing you talk about the details, not quite as concerned with that, because you are, you're, you're pulling the poetry, you're, you're pulling the sorrow out, you're, you're pulling this sort of connection with, with, with the earth that I think really fits with Americana music or sort of like uh, folk art, this type of stuff. Is that something that you are you're actively pursuing or you really are conscious of or it's just, just part of what you, what you do? You know, it's, I, I think it, it's, it's, it makes a lot of sense to think of it that way. Um, I teach a historical fiction class at the University of Denver where I teach, and um, when I, uh, I teach it, the students are always a little surprised that I'm not, we start with a book that's fairly traditional, I think it's, 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 fair, it's quite well done, The Girl with Pearl Earring by Tracy Chevalier, which some of you may, may have read and was made into a very beautiful uh, film. Um, and we start with that, and then we, we, we leap right to, we, then we talk about Herodotus, and we talk about history, uh, and, and we talk about lies, and, and how are different ways, you know, how can history and, and fiction interact in, in, uh, in different ways? And so then we, we look at things like um, Michael Ondaatje's The Collective Works of Billy the Kid or Coming Through Slaughter. Mm -hmm. uh, we look at um, W.G. Zabald and the way that he had these essays that include history that are s sort of like, f uh, sort of like uh, fiction. And all, you know, so all these different ways for history and fiction to, to interpenetrate and staying away from this notion. Again, I, I, there are many uh, traditional historical fiction novels that I, I, I really love, um, but it's, it's not where I, I have been drawn. Mm -hmm. And um, Americana, for, for a kid who was born in Singapore and, and grew up uh, before going to Indiana in the Netherlands and, and London, um, Americana, rural Indiana, hit me like a, a ton of bricks. Um, and it, it wasn't always uh, comfortable uh, but it was always engaging and intriguing and having, you know, again, the two, my, me and this grandmother in this farmhouse, and she would talk. She just never stopped talking. And it was a wonderful haunted voice, um, haunted, haunted by this past, which was really rooted in, you know, th these deep roots in, in, in America with all its contradictions um, and, and all its difficulties. And I find it really uh, endlessly fascinating. Mm. That's great. Let's open it up to, to questions. I would love to hear... Any, uh, any thoughts that you have? The, we'll come around with, with a mic, so please uh, just wait for that to, uh, to be in your hand. Uh, you said that you found it daunting, uh, but you choose to uh, write in the female voice. Mm -hmm. uh, could you talk about a comparison between writing in the female voice as distinct from writing as a male narrator? Hmm. Mm. Um, it's... Maybe when I think about it, what, what immediately leaps to mind is um, speaking in another language. So I speak English. I also speak a pretty darn good French. Um, I came by, uh, I think, pretty honestly uh, over, over the years. Um, but when I speak in this pretty darn good French, I'm always having to think about what I'm saying. Um, I'm always having to attend to um, uh, this, this larger sense of of my sentences and of what the sentences are gonna build into. And so when I slip into these voices of, of characters who are unlike me, uh, profoundly unlike me in, in some instances, I'm always having to be a little bit more aware uh, than if I was slipping into the voice. Um, and maybe this is just a trick of the mind, but um, if, if I had written these books from, uh, with, with a male narrator, um, there was a, a, maybe just a slightly more relaxed posture, some givens, um, some things I, I wouldn't need to explore. And so I, th I think it has made me think about this world, this fictional world, uh, in a much more deliberate way. Uh, doesn't mean that I don't, when I'm writing, I'm constantly thinking, okay, now this is a woman's voice and she's going to say this now because of this. It's not that. So I, I, I am able to um, sink into it uh, as a writer, but still my, my back is a little straighter. Um, my radar is a little more out, and I know I'll probably make uh, mistakes um, that uh, are, would, would only be called mistakes in, in the sense of, you know, a, a woman would never say that, a woman would never think that. But I, fortunately, my first reader is my wife, who's there to, to you know, clack, clack. Uh-uh, you know, <laughs> no. But, you know, that, that makes me think of an interesting thing that it was the, one of the first questions I was asked about um, when, I, when, when this book came out uh, by about five or six different people. Uh, which was, what about their periods, right? Um, and uh, that was very interesting to me um, because uh, 
I had, I had a very quick answer, which was that in 19th century literature writ large, first person, actual journals, books, etc., cetera, um, it's, oh, that, that particular biological necessity is almost never mentioned. So the scholars, Deanne uh, Blanton and, and Lauren Cook talk about this. Uh, and I said to myself, okay, so here I am a male writer in the 21st century, writing about 19th century women, wanting to be authentic uh, without trying to fool anyone. Uh, should I put something? And I thought, no, I'm not gonna project the 21st century notion of what we should be discussing. Well, you know, what about their periods and when they had to go to the bathroom and so on and so forth. Um, and so, but th these were all things that I thought a great deal about and had a lot of counsel, right? So I'd bring a lot of, of writers, and, uh, writers and, and loved ones into the conversation. And so often I'm wrong, but I try to be wrong with, uh, uh, with the best intentions. I think it's also really the voices. I feel like it's a possession. I mean, I feel like you were, you were somewhat possessed in it coming through you, that it was coming through you in a way that's like, this is, mm -hmm. this is the spirit that came through you, you know, and without, you, were the, you, were the, you were the transmitter, you know, yeah, in some sort yeah. of to, way. To a certain extent, that's true. Yeah. Okay, I was wondering if you found it intriguing or more challenging to take this voice of a different, totally different person, and if it becomes easier for you as you go from book to book, mm -hmm. because you've had the experience, you know, of writing a book like this before. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I was hoping it would be easier. <laughs> and I keep hoping it, it'll be easier, because I've, I've got this ridiculous project of these four different books. Um, the nice thing, it, so it, it hasn't become easier, and, and because each voice is distinct. So it's not that I'm just putting on a slightly different register of accent when I'm writing from book to, you know, so these characters have different concerns and different thoughts, and, and um, I'm very much the kind of writer, I don't know if you are as well, Kevin, who feels attacked by my desk when I sit down, it's sort of like Kafka describes, this debt with sharp edges, it's hard, it's hard work, it takes a long time, uh, and it always feels like a real challenge to me. And I, I sort of imagined that if it started to feel like I was, you know, sort of easing back in my chair as I wrote, that maybe it, it's time to, to move on to something else. I like to stay alert when I'm writing, um, and I like for it to be difficult. Uh, I am, I'm currently, so the, the, uh, the third novel is, is drafted, um, and I'm about halfway through the fourth one, the witch book. Uh, and, I, and I still feel like it, you know, I, I really need to be, be attentive, maybe even more so, because it's so easy to slip into... Uh, you know, repetitive gestures in your writing and do the same old thing and use that same kind of accent. Uh, some of you will have heard when I was reading, the accent starts to come on a little bit. Um, and depending on the passage, it comes on very hard. And, and I, you know, uh, I, I try to um, acknowledge that, but also try not to make it into too, something too farcical and too performative. You know, I'm gonna put on a heavy accent and talk about the 19th century. Um, and uh, it's, it's never quite that to me. It's, it's always, um, I always have to be very careful when I'm transmitting, when I'm feeling the voice hit me. Mm -hmm. I've heard writers say that they allow the characters to do what they're going to do as a result of who they are, and that becomes the plot, which I, I just kind of don't believe that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Could you talk a little bit about how you develop plots, how, how the twists come to you? I know that's a big subject, but mm. I'd be very interested to hear what you have to say. Sure. Yeah, it's, it's, I, I know what you're saying about that. that when, when you feel sort of possessed and a voice takes you over and you're just sort of following along. And the truth is there was some of that in, in this case. Um, and this, this particular voice, is she's very insistent and she didn't leave. Uh, she sort of set up residence. Um, and every once in a while would you know, hit me on the side of the head, so to speak. She's kind of a rough, rough and tumble character. Um, but having said that, uh, it, it was really, um, in the case of Kind One and now Never Home, uh, I, I could see the story before I, I, I started. So I could see the arc of it. It was as if with that, that first, uh, first sentence, and I had a first sentence in, in Kind One as well, um, I could sort of see where it was going. But there's all that getting there. There's all the getting there and, and all the days of working um, and it really was my writerly self having to detach um, from this voice that was speaking. Uh, and there were many paths that this character went down that my writerly self had to, to, to cut and, and leave aside. There was a whole, you know, because there is this sub-theme of, of an inversed odyssey, 
uh, in, in this, this novel. So it's Penelope who goes to war and Odysseus who stays home. It's Penelope who returns from war and kills the suitors. Uh, and Odysseus who sort of stands by, you know, by the side. Um, there was a real temptation once I realized that was happening. Again, I didn't say, I'm going to do an inverse odyssey and, and see, see what that gives me. Um, but I realized that was happening and there was this inclination to uh, go a little bit too far uh, into the patterning. So, you know, here, uh, here's, here's the moment where the, the Cyclops is, um, you know, in the way that Cold Mountain does, right? Cold Mountain by Charles Frazier is a very methodical kind of, we're going to hit the plot points of, of, of the Odyssey. So there were times when the, the, the voice was telling the story and, and, and the writer said, no, no, this is, too, this is too much. What will happen with the reader going through this is, you know, here we are at this moment, here we are at this moment. Oh, oh yeah, spotting uh, correspondences. So there were lots of decisions I made like that and quite a bit of, 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 of revision uh, and trial and error as well uh, because, you know, you've got the sentence by sentence thing, the paragraph by paragraph uh, aspect, but then there's the whole structure and novelists have to really be careful about the structure. Uh, and, and is every part of it pulsing with energy? And that's always key to me. It, it has to be pulsing at, at all points. You know, a reader might feel differently, but for me, it's all charged. It's charged with import, with meaning, um, and uh, the language is crackling, ideally. <laughs> yeah, I know. talk about your own recreational reading? <clears throat> yeah, absolutely. Um, I just finished reading a uh, crime novel by Henning Mankel, the great Swedish crime novelist who died recently. Died. Yeah, yeah. Um, and uh, so I, I was, I, I gobbled that up. I allow myself those in small doses because otherwise they would take over my life. I'm very susceptible. I, I love crime fiction. Um, and I've read a lot of it, so I have to, you know, I just, Every once in a while, I, I let myself do that. Um, what I've got on my bedside right now is, is uh, uh, the, the new Coates book, uh, Ta-Nehisi Ta Coates, uh, Between the World and Me, um, which is uh, intense uh, and um, a very different kind of thing. I don't feel very relaxed when I'm reading that, but I, I, uh, it's, the, it's the kind of reading I like to, to always have there. Um, and then I, uh, a, a, a series of books that I, I love very much, so thinking about genre and also, you know, a completely other side of me uh, is a, a series of, of science fiction novels by the writer Jeff Vandermeer called uh, the Southern Reach Trilogy. Um, so science fiction, crime, uh, uh, contemporary uh, politics and theory, um, and then the Elena Ferrante books. I don't know if anyone here is reading this, this great Italian writer, Elena Ferrante, mm -hmm. um, but if you aren't, be careful because once they get their hooks into you, it's really hard to stop. So she has a book called The Neapolitan Quartet, which is just absolutely wonderful. She's a contemporary writer and nobody knows who she is. She refuses to reveal her identity to the extent that some people speculate that it's a, a man writing as a woman. Um, and they're like, oh yeah, well, it's, it, that would be too beautiful to dream because they're so good <laughs> for someone who does that um, but is open about it. Anyway, so lots of different kinds of books. And then I, I live with a poet. And so I read a lot of poetry as well. And uh, there, there is no better reading experience. Do you read more than one book at a time? I do, yeah. Yeah, and some t I know um, it's, uh, I'm getting too overextended uh, when the pile piles up too much, <laughs> right? And so my bedside right now has about eight different books that I, I'm dipping in and out of. And I'm just, now I, I know I need to have one that I just will gobble up, which is probably the Coates book, because it's very short, and I think it'll be done in about 10 minutes. <laughs> Uh, you mentioned both Faulkner and Morrison in your mm -hmm. talk thus far, and um, I think you seem to be clearly inheriting from this long tradition of American writing that is sort of obsessed with, or perhaps haunted by, American history, mm -hmm. um, and perhaps history with a capital H. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm just wondering how you see yourself as someone who's inheriting from this tradition and what you think um, the position um, of someone writing in the 21st century is mm -hmm. about American history that is perhaps different from um, everyone else. I think that um, I mean I think that that's that's quite true. One of the one of the great things about writers like like Morrison uh, or Edward, Edward P. Jones or Faulkner is that they were certainly uh, dealing with history with capital H, but they were doing it by uh, inscribing and investigating history with with a lowercase h histories, um, and it is those uh, uh, 
th that sense of multiple narratives, multiple stories that are always feeding into that larger sense of, 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 of an era, what we think about a, a particular moment that seems ever more crucial to acknowledge um, these, um, the plurality of, of stories, experience, uh, and uh, working uh, in and against these monolithic interpretations of, of something like history, um, these, these larger categories, uh, so that um, you are speaking about the past but not assuming this notion, uh, not assuming what that past is, what that means to you know, as varied a group as, it, as is in this room today, um, and then you just multiply that out. And so th there's, a, there's a great deal of humility, I think, that comes with it, but always attending to um, those uh, stories that one has, has heard about with a, you know, sort of out of the corner of one's ear, so to speak, um, always intrigue me. Um, and uh, going after them, thinking about them, and attending to them, those, those narratives that, that are not uh, told. Um, as, as often as they should be. And I think about this young woman who, right after Never Home came out, this young woman said, why, why have you written this book from the point of view of a woman? Uh, and I said to her, because I think we as a culture, uh, no matter who we are, need to start telling the, these, these stories that have been untold. Uh, and for, you know, for better or worse, uh, we, you know, it's not that we don't need more stories about men, uh, but there are a heck of a lot of stories to be told about women. And you know, with all humility, I said to her, I'm, I'm attempting uh, to, to, to do that and uh, making, making my try. Will I forever be writing stories from the point of view of a woman? I don't think so, but four novels is a lot. Um, and so hopefully I, I will have <laughs> done my work. I hope it's not five. You never know. <laughs> Maybe a last question. Uh, and I build off of that one. You've uh, written historically about the Americana mm -hmm. female warrior. What do you th were you writing it and researching it during the time that we've had the present conversation mm -hmm. about female warriors? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So um, it, one of the things about writing about the Civil War you realize really quickly is that all of these things, the, the major issues are, are completely unresolved. Um, and so, so that a book Between the World and Me uh, feels like it's, it's taking up those, those uh, questions that have been, you know, uh, we thought there was this crucible that dealt with them. Not at all. Right, we all know that. Um, and so when I was writing this, it was absolutely in my mind uh, that uh, despite the fact that women have been now given the right to, to fight along the front lines, they still have to pass this, this other hurdle, right, which is passing these very specific um, uh, tests um, and uh, which were, of course, designed for a particular kind of person, particular kind of body, particular kind of, uh, you know, a body emboldened by notions of I can do this. And, um, and so the fact that so recently we've had these, these young women passing the Ranger, Army Ranger uh, exams has been so uh, uh, interesting and, and encouraging. And yet then there's all the blowback about, you know, well, they got special treatment and we're, you know, um, just to say that it is very much in my mind. Um, I have a 10 year old daughter. Um, so that makes it, you know, gives it an extra oomph um, in terms of, you know, what is her trajectory going forward in, in, in the world. Um, but these, they are unresolved questions. They're part of this American experience. Part of this question of citizenry um, is, is very much tied up in these issues uh, that exploded so uh, enormously in the mid-19th century. Uh, and those, you know, the, the firework, the bits and pieces are still falling, but with much greater weight than those little ephemeral things that fall in the sky when we see um, a firework display. It feels like it's very much still there, very much still present, and there's lots of work for all of us to do. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank well, you. Thank, thank you so much, Larry. Thanks, yeah. Kevin. Thanks yeah, for the conversation.